On today's show, we have a women's college basketball deep dive preview of what you will be seeing over the next few months right here on Locked in Women's Basketball and at the next. It starts right now. Hi, everyone. I'm Missy Heydrich, National Women's Basketball Correspondent for The Next, a television and radio basketball analyst and much retired former Division I shooting guard. Thank you for making Lockdown Women's Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Missy Heydrich and be sure to follow The Next at The Next Hoops and this podcast right here at Locked On Women's Basketball. You'll find all sorts of amazing information at both. Our deep dive today is here to give you a snapshot of the landscape of women's college basketball. The season ended just about one month ago, South Carolina being crowned national champions. And even though we think we should get a bit of a break, we really do not. We rolled right from the Final Four into the WNBA draft, and now WNBA training camps are fast and furious and taking flight. But the confetti has settled around college basketball. Contracts have been extended. Darius Rucker came through on his promise of a celebration concert on the South Carolina campus, and we are already talking about the 22-23 season. But before we start digging deep into next year, we have to take a little bit of time to look at what shaped this past season. One of the hottest topics anywhere in college basketball, both for women's and men's, right now it's unavoidable. It's the transfer portal. There have been over 800 plus student athletes in the portal at one time or another. Some kids entered it last winter enrolling at their new school for the second semester. It allowed them to practice, not to participate, but then it also gives them a chance to be there through the spring and summer months for all of the off-season conditioning and work and kind of maybe gives them a leg up before they drop onto campus and start for the fall. Most student athletes put their names in when their seasons are complete. There are just too many to name, so we are not even going to try to do that. But as the summer goes on, we'll talk more about impact transfers and what that means for the upcoming 22-23 season. Every day, new names appear in that portal and players exit when they find their new homes. We cannot lose sight that so many of these moves are really feasible now still because of that COVID year of eligibility. That clock is going to eventually run out, but there are so many student athletes that still have that option to utilize that eligibility. Back in the day, transferring really wasn't something student athletes did very much of. It just now, honestly, it's almost too easy for kids to make that move. And it can be based on a coaching change or something in their personal life. Sometimes it is the grad transfers that take it because of academics. When is that pendulum going to swing back the other way? It's really hard to tell, but the portal is here to stay for now one way or another. And we're going to talk more about it here at Locked On Women's Basketball and at the next. Every year, we see some coaching changes throughout college basketball as well. And as those, the ones that we looked at at the 21-22 season, some of them were with monumental shifts, shifts in culture, shifts in coaching style, playing style, and some rebuilding opportunities. Just a few to keep in, that we have kept an eye on, and we're going to talk more about as well as a lot of others. In the Big 12, you had two new coaches, both of whom took over for Hall of Famers themselves. You had Jenny Baranchik, who went into Oklahoma and had an outstanding first year. She was 25 and 9, got the Sooners back to the NCAA tournament for the first time since 2018. They even host hosted first and second round games of that tournament there in Norman. Nikki Collins, she went into Baylor. She left the Atlanta Dream and took that job last summer, and she stepped into big shoes in a huge job but produced results and another Big 12 regular season title. Baylor finished 28-7. and seven. They did bow out in the round of 32 after being beaten at home by South Dakota, who was on a roll in this last NCAA tournament. In the Pac-12, there were two big jobs. Both really seemed to be rebuilding opportunities. Lindsey Gottlieb, she left the Cleveland Cavaliers and came to USC. Tina Langley, she left Rice to go to Washington. They both had difficult years, but with time, those are rebuilding opportunities. They will have to recruit and they will have to manage the transfer portal, both things that happen there on the West Coast with a lot of competition for outstanding talent. We know Kim Mulkey surprised everybody last year when she left Baylor to go back to her home state of Louisiana and take over the LSU program. 
They went 26 and six last year. They spent the majority of the season in the top 25. And if anyone wants to think that LSU is back on the map, absolutely. They are one to be reckoned with, I think, going forward with the as in the SEC. And she is absolutely reaping the benefits of the transfer portal right now. We had some head coaches in their first years. Robin Shear Wells at Evansville, Ashley Langford at Stony Brook, Karen Aston at UTSA, all those mid-major programs. They had very good first years and seasons to build upon as they move forward. This episode of Locked on Women's Basketball is brought to you by Built Bar. Have you tried the puffs? If you haven't, you're missing out on Built Bar's, one of Built Bar's best tasting bars. Puffs are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy, and it's not just a protein bar, they're a treat and they are covered in 100% real chocolate. Yes, all Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate, even the puffs. Low calorie, high protein, replace your candy bar with these, and I love candy, they are better. Typical candy bar can be anywhere from two to 300 calories. If you go to built.com and scroll down to the macros chart, you're gonna be blown away. High protein, low cal, high fiber, low carb. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. So compare that to a candy bar that usually has around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. At Built Bar, they are all about taste, which is so important. They make it taste delicious first and then figure out how to make it healthy. I don't know how they do it, but they pull it off every time. So go to Built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, and get 15% off your order. Use that promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. I am Missy Heydrich. Thank you so much for being here and listening and making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen. For your next listen, though, check out the Locked On Now podcast, nightly recaps of every NBA game with analysis from our local experts. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. As we continue to think about what's ahead for college basketball in the next year, one topic that actually started last summer that's going to continue to shape college athletics as a whole for many years to come is conference realignment. We can thank Texas and Oklahoma for getting that ball rolling, no pun intended, with their announcement last July that they are going to be heading to the SEC. So then that put the Big 12 on the defensive. They had to figure out what they were going to do to try to rally and keep that league together, and they did so by being able to add four schools that will be joining by 2024, if not before. You've got BYU, Central Florida, Cincinnati, and Houston, all which have great impact on women's basketball. And keep your eye on BYU because they could join the league sooner than that. They have the easiest route to be able to make that decision because they continue to be an independent right now and exit from the WAC. The Pac-12, Big Ten, and ACC then, they were able to create their alliance, which really puts emphasis on competitive scheduling across all sports. And it's something we're going to continue to watch over the next few years because of the success of these leagues in women's basketball. It really does elevate that competition level. It keeps those quad one wins high. When you think about net rankings and all of the things things that go into NCAA tournament selection. But the trickle-down effect, really, of the Texas and Oklahoma decision and what happened with the SEC and the Big 12 didn't as much impact the Power Fives as it does more of your mid-major conferences. And as we think about women's basketball, I believe it's only going to be a positive as things move forward. The movements of institutions helps to elevate women's basketball in all of these leagues. It makes them more competitive. It changes and enhances the ge geographical areas for recruiting. It leverages television contracts and exposure opportunities so that when coaches are having conversations with parents and grandparents and all of the people in, with a potential student athlete, they can talk about how you're going to see that player on TV and be able to get to where those games are going to be. Even though conference moves are messy and expensive in a lot of different cases, I think women's basketball is going to benefit in the long run. Let's take the Missouri Valley, for instance. You've got Murray State, Illinois, Chicago, and Belmont are headed there. 
Belmont, they were 23 and 8 last season, and they advanced to the second round of the NCAA tournament with that huge win over Oregon in the first round. They've also got one of the best guards in the country, and Destiny Wells, she's just a sophomore, just finished her sophomore year. The Atlantic 10, they are going to gain Loyola Chicago, ironically, from the Missouri Valley. And so the A-10 will now go to 15 schools. But you've got programs like Rhode Island and Dayton and UMass, all contenders and big-time mid-major winners in women's basketball. Stony Brook, who's had a much a trajectory of success, they were 23-6 and six last year and spent most of the season ranked in the mid-major polls. They are going to leave the American East, and they are headed to the Colonial Athletic Association. There are a ton of other conferences where movement is coming, and it is going to be tough to be able to keep track of it all. We've got the WAC, Big South, Big Sky, Horizon, Ohio Valley, American, the A-Sun, just to name a few. All of these leagues have solid women's basketball programs and create a competitive regular season and a competitive conference tournament. We have to remember that when you're in that mid-major universe, so much of the emphasis is put on that conference tournament, that postseason opportunity, because that's where the automatic qualifying bid comes. Now, as you elevate your league and the competition continues to grow, and we see more parity in women's basketball, well, now all of a sudden, some leagues are going to have an opportunity for maybe two or three bids into to the big dance. Those at-large selections come because of what they do during the regular season, not only who they'll play in their non-conference, but because they have highly competitive conference schedules as well. As we navigate some of these new conference affiliations, it sometimes aligns with new faces that are taking over head coaching jobs across the country. But we've had some big time retirements in women's basketball in 2022, people that have made a huge impact on the sport. Charlie Turner Thorne, after 25 seasons retiring at Arizona State. Gary Blair, 19 seasons as a head coach at Texas A&M and also many years as the head coach at Arkansas. Mike Carey, 21 years at West Virginia, is retiring. Jeff Judkins at BYU, 21 seasons, and he is now retiring. And Sue Semerow, 24 years as the head coach at Florida State. She will be retiring there in Tallahassee. And one of the best stories, I think, in women's basketball, Kathy Delaney Smith, the head coach at Harvard, 40 years she has been the head coach there for the Crimson, and she has done an amazing job. And if you haven't yet, please, please go to the next and check out the fantastic story done by Jen Hatfield about the journey of Coach Delaney Smith. She talked about 40 years of relationships and the student athletes and all of the people that have been part of her program and touched a little bit of women's basketball at Harvard. It is a fantastic read, just one of so many awesome things you will find at the next and from all of my colleagues right here on this Locked On Women's Basketball podcast. So now we know as we move forward and we think about what we're going to talk about this summer and preview is that there are some others that we're going to look at with a sharper lens for new coaches around the country. There's changes at Florida where you've got Kelly Ray Finley, that earned term tag was taken and she is now the head coach of the Gators and Brooke Wyckoff takes over for Sue Semerow as the head coach at Florida State. Shauna Green's move to Illinois from Dayton. She was six years as the head coach of the Flyers and they were 26 and six last year. One of the hot names in college coaching, and she lands at Illinois. The domino effect of Joni Taylor leaving Georgia for another SEC school going to Texas A&M. And then that brings Kate Abramson Henderson back to Georgia. She leaves Central Florida to take the head job of the Bulldogs. She played two years at Georgia before she transferred and then finished her career at Iowa under Vivian Stringer. First-time head coach Sam Purcell, he's taking over at Mississippi State after many years on the bench with Jeff Walls at Louisville. Mississippi State is a very interesting environment right now because they're actually going to have two new head basketball coaches. Chris Jans takes over their men's program, and so it is a complete reset at all aspects of basketball in Starksville. Keep an eye on that. It'll be very interesting to see how the fan base reacts and what type of excitement they can generate there during the winter months. One note of interest as we kind of continue to talk about conference realignment and conference moves and then some of these coaching moves, both Central Florida and BYU, two highly successful women's basketball programs, 
And their move to the Big 12 is absolutely going to elevate the league even more when they get there than it already is. They're going to have new head coaches when they make that move, whether it's in the next year or two. When you take over a program, it's one thing. But when you take over within your first two years and you're going to go from a mid-major to a P5 league, that is absolutely a huge challenge. Satya Messer, she's been hired at Central Florida and BYU is still in their national search. So stay tuned. It will be very interesting to watch. And if you are doing the math, you are correct. There are three new head coaches in the state of Florida for women's basketball programs, Central Florida, Florida, and Florida State. A lot going on in the, shun in the Sunshine State, that is for sure. Here at Lockdown Women's Basketball, we want to say thank you to our sponsors, and one of them is BetOnline.net, your number one source for all of your betting stats and sports info. Find all of the latest sports developments, league reviews, news, including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of Major League Baseball. Bet Online is your continued source for all of your sporting wagering information, from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today and use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet Online, where the game starts. I'm Missy Heydrick, and again, welcome and thank you so much for listening here on the Locked on Women's Basketball podcast. The last part of our college basketball summer preview kind of lands squarely on the parts I always think is most important. It's the people that make women's basketball really what it is today. You know, college athletics is a fast moving business, a business being the operative word. We see it all the time, whether we want to talk about coaching contracts or what's happening with um, media rights, all of those things. And IL, name, image, and likeness. It is here to stay and part of every conversation in every athletic department across the country. It is part of the conversation that coaches are having right now in all of their offices as they evaluate recruits and what they want to do. It is part and it's not going anywhere. So it's something that everybody has to continue to navigate. But when we kind of drill down, this game really is about the student athletes and it's about those that elevate women's basketball across the country. I think it's their stories of the breakout season of players or those that made a great comeback or coaches that are getting their first head job and a crack at that seat to take over a program and to do it their way or the administrators and all of the support staff across the country that work tirelessly to bring women's basketball to more eyes and tv screens if this past season has shown us anything, it is just that people will watch and that we know that when you put more eyes on devices and screens and in stadiums, that people will watch and they will come and they will come in person. So here at Lockdown Women's Basketball and at the next, we're not only going to tell you the news pieces and the things that you need to know, but show you kind of those unsung heroes around the college game. The players maybe that they could have left, but they've decided to stay to finish their careers and the ones that are also making an impact both on and off the floor. Sometimes those are the stories we don't always hear, but we do really like to tell them to you. You can find me at Missy Hydric on Twitter and all of my amazing colleagues when you get on at Locked On Women's Basketball on Twitter and at The Next Hoops on Twitter as well. You will see everyone there and all of the amazing work that they do day in and day out, not only to cover women's college basketball, but the WNBA and everything you need to know. Thank you for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every day. Now, Make your second listen locked on NBA from the first jump ball of the play in tournament to the last possession of the finals. Locked on experts take you deep inside the playoffs with insight and analysis affecting all 30 teams. Thank you so much for watching and listening today. We will see you next time right here at Locked On Women's Basketball.